and welcome to the Word of Truth, the Sunday School Class of the Air with your teacher, Rod Payne. The Word of Truth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you're joining us for the Word of Truth, I thank you so much for watching this program. If you noticed on the other shot, and I'll hold them up now, I've got a couple of reference works that I'm going to reference today as we begin our study, two weeks study, in the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon. This is a passage of Scripture that I love because in all sincerity, I'm excited that God devised men and women the way He devised us, the way that He put us together, the way that He gave us all the blessings that He gives through the act of marriage and through the wonders of being married. I love it. But I have to also tell you in all sincerity, we could have done Ecclesiastes and I'd have been okay with that as opposed to jumping into the Song of Songs. But over the 20 plus, almost 30 years, maybe it has been more than 30 years now that I've done this, or I've been a part of this program, it has been more than 30 years, we generally go through the Bible about every eight years in the explore, what we now call the Explore the Bible uh, pass, or curriculum. So in all sincerity, about sometime in every eight years, it's going to come up, and it's okay. If the picture looks a little redder sometimes during the course of this program, is not your set. Do not adjust like they used to say on the outer limits. You're set. It'll be just me blushing. So we'll just get that put aside. Before we get into today's uh, time together in the lesson, I want to say happy birthday to any of you who are celebrating birthdays. I know that these are difficult times. And for some of you, it's meant you've not been able to celebrate with family or friends because of your particular residence and uh, where you are right now in life, perhaps where you are in age or where you are in the, um, perhaps health and whether or not you could contract the uh, COVID or the coronavirus, things of that nature. I know it's difficult, but I want you to know God loves you so much that he promised in his word to never leave you or forsake you. And that promise holds true regardless of what's transpiring outside the door of your apartment, of your home, of your whatever. God loves you and he promised never to leave you. So he is with you. He is with me. He is with us right now. I don't know how the world that doesn't know Jesus is dealing with everything that's gone on from the weather to uh, corona to civil unrest to injustice i don't know how those who do not know jesus deal with any of this but i know how we're supposed to the word of god tells us to trust him and obey him and again i love the classic hymns of the faith trust and obey the hymn says for there's no other way to be happy in jesus than to trust and obey some of you are continuing to watch this program and not meeting in your life groups. Others of you are watching this program, but also trying to do even through social distancing and preparatory things with masks and other things, trying to meet together. However, you are studying God's word. Don't stop. Don't stop. Oh, I was so excited when they announced the beginning of 2020 and who knew what was going to happen. That was providential of God. But when they announced at First Baptist here in Wichita that Beginning in 2020, they were going to present a read the Bible through plan. I've had one now for 33 plus years, and I've loved it. It's a Bible. I'm on my third version of it or my third copy of it because eventually they do fall apart. But I love having a Bible that takes me through a portion of the Old Testament, a portion of the New, portions of Psalm, portions of Proverbs. We repeat the Psalms, uh, but I love having that Bible because it lays it out for me. And if I follow that reading plan every day, regardless of what else is going on, I know I've got word, God's Word being sown into my life. So even in addition to preparing for our time together, I've got that word being sown into my life. And I promise you it does, as it says in it, it does not return void. It always brings a harvest. Today we look at a, we begin our study, two-week study, in the book, The Song of Songs. 
there's a lot of different uh, theory about uh, the authorship, but most people will agree we're looking at Solomon as the author. He is one of several voices that we have. I'm going to refer first to my wonderful, was edited by the late F.F. F. Bruce, the New International Bible Commentary, because I do teach from the NIV. And so I love this commentary. The song, this song, is from that wisdom genre of literature that we find in the Bible. It has a kind of a parallel in its recognition of David as the founder and patron of the school of Psalmody. Oh, all these allusions to Solomon, the song, show him as a distant figure and not always the best example for somebody who's trying to woo somebody into a relationship. But we do know this. While the poet's name has not come down to us, many scholars insists that the song has no single author, but it's a collection of lyrics. On the other hand, again, there are those who attribute it to uh, Solomon's influence or Solomon, uh, that kind of thing. Here's the bottom line. We know this. There is a reason that God left it in his word. And I want to look at that real quick in a book that I've referred to on more than one occasion. In fact, the guy who's running camera asked me once, what's the name of that book again for my wife? It's called Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties. It was edited by Gleason Archer. It was written by Gleason Archer. I've referred to this book on more than one occasion, I'm trying to hold it so it, so it, there you can see it just right. The, the Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties by Gleason Archer. If I walked over there to that camera, you'd see it a little closer, but just trust me when I tell you, that's the name of the book. This book talks about almost every incident, if not every incident, where somebody tries to point out a discrepancy or a contradictory passage or other passages in the Bible, and it addresses each one of them very well. Here's how Archer addresses the Song of Solomon. How did such a book, is the question posed, as the Song of Solomon get to be a part of the Bible? I think that after having read it, some people might say that's a legitimate question. There's no denying, he writes back, that the Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, as it is called in some versions of the Bible, is a very different book from the rest of the Bible. Its theme is not doctrine, but inner feelings, the most exciting and uplifting of all the emotions, the emotion of love. How does Jesus describe his relationship with those of us who are believers in him? He calls us his bride. And he says that he's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for his church, his bride. I think as we read the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs together, I want us to consider that there are several different levels on which this book may be addressed. Obviously, it is a love story. And there are several different characters to be portrayed in that love story. The groom, eventually, but at the, the male figure, let's say. The lass, or the female figure, a chorus of others, and friends. But I also want us to consider that this love song, from one to the other, and sometimes from the other to the one, this love song was left for us in God's Word because He wanted us to know that He created men and women, men and women, not men and men, not ladies and ladies. He created men and women to know that passion, that, that admiration, that love for one another. And it's okay to do so. Over the many, many years of the Christian church, those who have a professed faith in Christ, there have been some who have said, marriage is not. And you know what Paul said? For some, probably better. They could pursue their relationship with Christ. They could pursue the things of God better not to have gotten married. But then he also admonishes, but better for you to marry than for you to burn. There is burning passion, as Elvis would describe it, hunk a hunk of burning love. There is burning passion described in these passages. But understand, always understand, the context in which the passion is presented and the desired godly outcome with which it will be evidenced. I want to read one more part, part from Archer's here. From the perspective of understanding this deep emotional commitment of a good husband toward the wife he adores, 
it bears with it a relationship. And from this perspective, then we in turn look at the Song of Solomon and its lyric emotional imagery, which is constructed like a mood-creating symphony written by a musical genius and performed by a magnificent orchestra. If you look at it in that fashion, if you're not keeping your mind in the wrong place, but if you look at this entire book as, a, as he describes it here, a mood-creating symphony written by a musical genius and performed by a magnificent orchestra, I believe you'll see the beauty in the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon. And in that beauty, you'll see God once again revealing in a miraculous way, literary, in a literary fashion, what love is supposed to look like. Years ago, there was a popular singer. Her name was Tina Turner. While she, I don't believe she penned the lyrics to this song, she sang a song that became to some degree popular, but it really posed a very awful question. And the question was, what's love got to do with it? In all sincerity, the video that accompanied that song and its widespread release into the American and to later on the world public was a video that was inappropriate, as often Miss uh, Turner might have dressed in a fashion that was not exactly uh, demure, or um, uh, let's just say she had a tendency towards risque attire. But in all sincerity, the video that asked what's love got to do with it in the song that posed the same question really cuts to the heart of so many times the relationships that people experience today. Because in all sincerity, many times they don't express the passion found between the two main characters in the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, but instead it's sometimes, well, we're the last two people that we know that haven't yet wed, so let's go ahead and tie the knot. Or I got nothing better to do, so let's get married. Love should be passionate. Love should have a fervor about it that says, without you, as Nielsen wrote, I don't want to live. I believe it was Harry Nielsen who wrote that song. In any respect, I can't live, the song said, if living is without you. That's a pretty good paraphrase of how love is expressed in the Song of Songs. Chapter 2, they skip right over chapter 1 and the vast half of chapter 2. Your quarterly has us starting in chapter 2, verse 15. Oh, here's the way it goes. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, are vineyards that are in bloom. And your quarterly correctly points out that the best way we can look at the opening verse that we're starting with in chapter 2, verse 15, is the fact that we need to make sure in our marriages that there are no other extraneous outside forces that could ruin, as it's translated in the NIV translation, that could ruin the vineyard or ruin the marriage. Your quarterly's author says, you can equate vineyard with marriage. You can equate that in this particular passage. The little foxes are those insidious little animals that can somehow or another worm their way through the fence or find a way through an opening somehow or another and pluck the grapes off the vines or destroy in some way the harvest. Now, I don't know what is in the fare or the, uh, the meal plan of a fox. Have to confess to you, I've never studied them, don't have any idea at all. In fact, the closest I've ever studied foxes is probably in Disney's The Fox and the Hound. I don't really have an understanding of this particular species. To be honest with you, don't know anything about bobcats either. The vast amount of things I don't know something about would fill, you know, volumes, okay? I don't know anything at all about foxes. But apparently, in this case, grapes were on the menu. Here's the bottom line. When we allow anything into the marriage, into the relationship, this is before they're married here, but eventually that's what the, we, this is all leading to. When we allow anything, though, to enter into and to inflict or to, uh, to affect or infest our relationship with that other significant person, that that's either potential spouse, future spouse, or, or our spouse, it wrecks havoc. It ruins the vineyard. And as such, there's no harvest. There's no crop. There's no blessing from what's been planted. 
what happens in today's world? Even in the, in the church of Jesus Christ? The, the statistics tell us that guys in the church are just as likely to be affected by pornography as guys outside the church. Dear body of Christ, listen to me. That's a little fox, and it becomes eventually a great beast, and it destroys homes. In the same way that people say, just a little taste of alcohol or just a little smoking of marijuana as a recreational way to kind of take the edge off things on the weekend or something of that nature, or maybe I'll just gamble a little bit. No. Because what happens, apparently, is foxes like to travel either in packs or they like to travel where they destroy. And they're, you know, the old expression, clever as a fox, sly as a fox, something of that nature. We don't need Satan to do that kind of work in the married life. We don't need him to do that kind of work in the coming-to-be married life. If I could speak to young men today, one of the things I would tell them is, Turn it off, turn away, turn to Christ. Turn it off, get off the internet, turn away. Don't look at those ads even that come up that proliferate our television, except for things like CFT, but turn away and turn to Christ. You know, the most important thing a young man can do is give his heart and life. The most important thing a person can do is give their heart and life to Christ. But a young man especially has got to guard his ways. An older man's got to do the same thing, though. These kind of things destroy marriages, destroy lives. And people want to say it's a victimless crime. They want to say pornography is a victimless crime. That's not true. And there are countless, especially women victims of pornography that will tell you, that have given their testimonies, that will say they were victims and they were treated horrifically. And if they didn't do what was told to them by the director or the person in charge of the quote-unquote video shoot, that they themselves suffered and that later on they couldn't look themselves in the mirror. They couldn't even look at themselves because they felt so ashamed what had happened. God can forgive. God can cleanse. God can make anew a life that has been shattered and broken. But don't say that pornography is a victimless crime. It is not. And God knows how those little foxes come in and they destroy the vineyard. Verse 16 here we have a description of one's person, one person's passion for another. My beloved is mine and I am his. This is the lady talking. He browses among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. You don't need to look any further, she says. You've found the one that should be your one. Before I propose to Vicky. I went to a man whose um, who's, uh, counsel I, I treasured greatly, and I went to him and I said, Ray, he's since passed, and I said, Ray, how do you know when it's the right time to ask? How do you know if they're the right person and you should ask? And Ray said to me, Rod, if you have to ask that question, it's the right time. It's the right person. And I did. I asked the late Ray Snook, should I ask Vicki to marry me? And he said, if you have to ask it's the right person. She says, don't be, you, you're out there right now. You're browsing among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. You're out there overnight, but you don't have to be. Turn away from that, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. Come back to me. I have loved Burns and Allen since I was a kid, and I still have DVDs of Burns and Allen's program and just used to just laugh until it hurt to watch them. And especially, you know, by the way, I hope you know this, Gracie was not the nincompoop she portrayed on the radio, in film, or certainly not on television. She was a smart, shrewd lady. She had to be, to be the comedic foil for somebody like George Burns, for heaven's sake. She had to be to have that persona of the ditzy Gracie. She was not that person in real life. George Burns was probably George Burns from vaudeville all the way through the movies, all the way through the last movie where he portrayed, I think his last movie, he portrayed deity to some degree. But in all sincerity, Gracie Allen was not like that. 
the bottom, what am I trying to make? What's the point here? In all sincerity, George Burns knew, and, and he, he talks about this in his writings, he knew when he met Gracie Allen, that's the one. That's the one I've got to do whatever I've got to do to make sure that we team up and that this thing, you know, and in all sincerity, they did. Guys, there may be some young men watching. When you find the right one and God's laid it on your heart that it's the right one, you don't need to browse anymore. I like the hymns, but I've also got an affinity for old pop music of the American genre. Okay, I talked about Hoagie Carmichael last week. Let me talk a little Motown to you this week. Very, very popular song early on in the history of Motown records that said, you better shop around. My mama told me you better shop around. No, 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 you don't need to. Okay, that's why the dating scene of the 2020, which with coronavirus has changed. But let's say the dating scene of 2019, go back, you know, in the last year and in the years previous that the dating scene, they talked about young people pretty much just having what they call, quote unquote, hookups or friends with benefits, quote unquote. That's not it. That's not it. When you find the right one, you be like that stag, guys. You be like that gazelle. Uh, you head for the hills. You go where the woman is that God has designed for you. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Vicky, if I didn't snatch her up, that some Nazarene preacher boy was going to do so because she was attending a Nazarene college when I proposed. She got baptized into the Baptist church, following after me. Praise God that she did because that would have been a strange household between the two different, although I have great affinity for all Nazarenes and still, still do, still find that to be one of the great denominations in, in, the, in the cause of Christ. But my wife was attending a Nazarene school. Uh, Bethany Nazarene was called back then. Now I think it's called Southern Star or something. But she was attending a Nazarene school and I proposed. But I'll tell you this, I knew I needed to. I knew she was the one and still is for me today, praise God. But I knew she was the one and I didn't need to browse any further. All night long, verse 1 of chapter 3 says, On my bed I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but I didn't find him. By the way, she's not looking to take him to her bed before they get married, as I will explain and as the passage that we continue in chapter 3 illustrates strongly. But she's longing for him. She's just long, and she's got a passion that's just unbounded. Verse 2, I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and its squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but I didn't find him. Now, sometimes popular songs can encapsulate the Word of God very, very well, even though they're not written from a biblical perspective. And I'm thinking of a country hit that said, looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for, you know what? She was looking for love in all the wrong places. Don't you wish I could use illustrations that were more contemporary? Well, it's just not as good. The young people today, it's hard to understand much of what they're saying. And when you do, you ask yourself, really? They allowed that to be broadcast anywhere. That song, that country song, said looking by the way that was popular during the time of the gillies franchise when everybody wanted to be an urban cowboy it didn't really ever catch fire in eight oklahoma just telling you that for reference but that song was popular during that time and the idea of that song is actually encapsulated or that song actually encapsulates these first couple of verses here don't go looking for god's perfect choice for you in places where they aren't you read dear abby I read Dear Abby on occasion. I do the crossword that's adjacent to Dear Abby in the thin tissue that comes now described as our local newspaper. But I still take it because I want to read different sections of it. And I also want to find out what happened a couple of days ago in Wichita. But, uh, but in any respect, I do the crossword puzzle every day, uh, by and large. And uh, Abby's column's over to the right. And quite often, there are people who are saying, I just can't seem to find Miss Wright, Mr. Wright. And in all sincerity... If you're looking for love in all the wrong places, if you're going out to bars and watering holes and things like that, 
What kind of people do you think you're going to find there? Are you going to find, uh, you may find a Christian person there. I, I'm, I'm not going to characterize everybody who attends uh, as being all of them, uh, you know, of the same mind. But in all sincerity, you're more likely to find, it's in the same way, if, if I want to find a swimming suit, it's very rare for me to go to the filling station. I still trade at a filling station. That's where I gas up my vehicles, at a real filling station. There's about two or three of them left in Wichita, and I go to the one on Jacksboro Highway and have ever since my other one uh, closed on uh, Midwestern Parkway and Taft. But if I'm going to buy a swimming suit, I don't go to the filling station. If I'm looking for the right mate, I found my wife at school and then started following her to church. So in all sincerity, she was looking, but she wasn't in the right places. So she says, verse, verse 3, the watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves, she asked? Mm -mm -mm. Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. She looked all these other places, but then she found him. She found the one her heart loves. I held him and would not let him go. And then, listen, till I brought him to my mother's house. I remember very well calling Vicky's dad and mom and saying, I'm wanting to ask your, for, your, for your daughter's hand in marriage. In fact, I'm, I've, I've already done it. Just did it about five minutes ago. I want to make sure you're okay with that. She wants to bring him home to meet the parents. Now, again, in popular culture, there was a movie a few years ago that, yes, it had some inappropriate content and some bad references, but the... <laughs> bottom line was that meet the parents exercise for that young man who's both Mr. Stiller who's both his parents were comics too that was a riot because that's kind of not how you want to be introduced to the parents she says here I held him and would not let him go I held him and I wouldn't let him go till I brought him to my mother's house to the room of the one who conceived me I brought him home to meet my mom. Now, your quarterly correctly points out that if this is indeed Solomon that we're describing, and this guy's got a harem, well, I mean, we know this guy had a number of wives, including even foreign wives, but if she's bringing him home to meet her mom, maybe she doesn't recognize who Solomon is right now. And he's fallen basically for a shepherdess, a young lady who is not from the royal class. It's okay. Because God's in it, and God has a plan. Verse 5, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken, uh, awaken love until it so desires. Wait on God to show you that perfect one, and then jump in with both feet. We will continue and finish up that quickly. The Song of Songs next week and wrap up this quarter. But I want to invite you, please come back next week. And then the week after that, we begin a whole new study. But meanwhile, I want to remind you, you can write to us at The Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and the zip code is 76301. That address again is The Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. We will finish up The Song of Songs next week. I hope you'll join us right here on The Word of Truth. I look forward to seeing you then. You've been watching The Word of Truth from First Baptist Church, Wichita Falls. Join us again next week for The Word of Truth.